Welcome everyone to yet another how to build a PC tutorial. This time we're going high end. I've already done an intro budget build. If you guys are interested and you're just getting started, check out that video. It is already live on my channel. Today's video is sponsored by Micro Center because whether you're building a budget system or a high end rig, you gotta get parts somewhere and Micro Center is one of the best places to buy them, especially if you can go in in person to do some shopping. That's what we're gonna do today. I already have the parts picked out for today's build, but if you're shopping at Micro Center, you can use their custom PC builder on the website to pick out your parts. It will ensure compatibility, and then you can pick them up in store. But every time I come here, I'm like, where do I begin? They have so many different sections. It's like a tech wonderland. So let's just wander around a little bit. Micro Center has laptops and lots of finished consumer goods as well. I find it to be really nice as opposed to shopping online to be able to come into the store and actually physically pick up the thing that you might be considering buying. What a pretty flower. 3D printers? They got 3D printers too. Bring your kids, they've even got a toy section. Of course, you will eventually make your way over to the component section, which is basically this entire side of the store, the build your own PC area. Everything from power supplies to CPU coolers to motherboards, CPUs themselves, of course. And hey, shout out to Darbauer. They even have stuff for high-end liquid cooling as well as exotic cooling, like Thermal Grizzly liquid metal. Okay, guys, we're over here by the CPUs. And let me, let me just tell you, if you're shopping for computer parts, uh, I don't think any store has better prices on CPUs specifically than Micro Center. In fact, I used to work for a different retailer who sold CPUs, and I would often come down here to the Micro Center in Tustin to buy from them simply because their prices were so good. Yes, that includes AMD Ryzen CPUs as well as Intel. And uh, look, they've even got the newest ones, the 7950X 3D as well as the elusive 7900X 3D. I could honestly make a whole video just on shopping at Micro Center, but uh, I'm starting to get the components together here. We've got the 13900K CPU. I'll show you guys the rest of the stuff when we get back to the office, but we do need to get a case. Another benefit to shopping in person, cases can be very big, can be very small. Sometimes it's hard to tell with pictures online. Here we can look at each one, get a better idea of how they actually look in person. They even have some systems built here, uh, but the case we're using today is gonna be this one right here from Lian Lee. Ugh. All right, I think I got all my gear, so let's head back and build this system. Big thank you to the folks here at Micro Center for having me stop by. Just need to check out now with their friendly and knowledgeable support staff. There's no one over here. <laughs> go, 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 go. <laughs> A high-end gaming PC often adds variables and complexity to the build process that the budget builder doesn't even have to consider. If you're spending two to three grand on a PC, you're probably not just upgrading your core components like the highest end CPU or graphics card that you can get your hands on, but you're also probably gonna be working with an aftermarket CPU cooler, for example, maybe an all-in-one liquid cooler that requires a pump block installation as well as a radiator. You might be working with multiple storage devices, multiple M.2 SSDs that you wanna make sure you install to the right slots on the motherboard. You might have a high-end case that has a few more features that you wanna take advantage of, and perhaps most importantly, or least importantly, depending on who you are, you probably have RGB LED lighting, and getting that plugged in properly can be a bit of a bear. So once again, today's part three tutorial is going to assume that you've familiarized yourself with the stuff I talked about in part one, learning all the parts, part two, doing a basic budget build, and of course that you've selected all your components and you have your tools and your workspace set up in an ideal way. Fortunately, that prep work is pretty much the same as it was in the budget build. We have some screwdrivers down here, as well as a knife to open stuff up with. So let's take a look at the parts that we picked up over at Micro Center. This video is more about the build process than choosing parts, but I did want to cover the parts that we are working with, and we're going to start with the core components that most affect the performance of the system, and that's going to be the CPU and the graphics card. For a high-end build that's focused on PC gaming, you're probably going to want one of the best CPUs for PC gaming that's currently available, and over on the Intel side, the 13900K, 13900KS, and even slightly step-down chips like the 13700K are your best, most viable options for getting the most performance that you can out of your graphics card. If you plan to do more with 
with your system than just gaming, then going with a higher core and thread count CPU like the 13900K is totally a good thing to do. But you may not necessarily need all those cores and threads, which is why uh, chips like the 13700K on the Intel side or AMD's 3D vCache enabled CPUs are also totally good choices. So from AMD, chips on the high end like the 7950X3D and the 7900X3D are good choices. Then you have the 7800X3D like this one if you don't need quite so many cores and threads. But I covered installation for both of these types of CPU sockets in the part two video, and I'll be covering installation of coolers for both of these sockets today. And that is one of the earliest considerations to make for a high-end build is that these CPUs often do not come with coolers because they're assuming while well, you're spending two or three grand on a system, you're probably going to add a better cooler than the stock ones that they provide. So our system is going to use a Corsair IQ H150i Elite Capellix 360 millimeter AIO all in one liquid cooler. But there are also lots of totally viable air cooled options like this one here from Thermalright. But do note that you might need to check out your cooler's actual installation manual or check out an additional video if you have something that's a little bit more specialized that I'm not using today. Next up is our graphics card. And for the high-end builder for whom money is no object, just going with the fastest card available is a pretty easy and good way to go. Granted, cards like our ROG Strix gaming version of the RTX 4090 can cost up towards like $2,000 just for the card itself. So if you are on a budget or just considering other options, AMD tends to offer a little bit better in terms of price to performance. And their current flagship is the Radeon RX 7900 XTX. It's not going to give you quite as much performance as an RTX 4090, but it does cost more like $1,000 versus $2,000. Beyond those two most important components, I'm just going to go over the rest of these left to right. We have a higher end power supply, 1,350 watts in this Thermaltake Tough Power GF3 80 plus gold rated. And if you are building with NVIDIA's 40 series and you have a card that has a PCIe Gen 5 or 12 VH power 16 pin connector, then getting a GPU that has that natively uh, is a good way to go. Although the card should come with an adapter that you can use if your power supply doesn't provide it. Next, we have storage. In the part two video, we covered uh, connecting SATA drives like 2.5 inch and 3.5 inch. Uh, SATA drives, but a high-end PC can get away with M.2 drives and you can actually get a lot of storage in M.2 drives if you have a motherboard that has multiple M.2 slots. So we have three two terabyte drives here for six terabytes total, which is plenty of storage. The WD drive is the fastest because it's a PCIe Gen 4 drive. And for some supplemental storage, we have these Crucial P3 drives, which are still two terabytes. They are PCIe Gen 3, so they are not quite as fast as the Gen 4 drive. You can see they top out at about 3,500 megabytes per second reads and writes versus 7,300 for the WD Black SN850X. So we'll be talking a little bit about SSD heat sinks as well as the proper installation to the proper slots on the motherboard when we install them to our motherboard. And our motherboard is the ROG Strix Z790-E Gaming Wi-Fi. Because part of my plan with this build is to synchronize the RGB elements as much as possible to simplify the RGB setup process. So having a motherboard and a graphics card that are from the same brand and part of the same series should help us with that. We also have a lot of memory, 64 gigs total of Corsair DDR5 Dominator Platinum RGB. I should note that you should ignore a lot of the price tags that are on these that came from Micro Center. A lot of these are the original retail prices but have been heavily discounted since. But again, since this is an RGB element from the build, I chose Corsair because Corsair and Asus have worked uh, pretty closely together to make sure that their RGB components play nicely together. So we'll see how it turns out once everything is built, but I'm hope hoping to have some level of RGB harmony in this build. Rounding things out, we have our case, the Lian Li Lan Cool 3, a popular case because it's large, it can fit high-end components. This is the white version of it, which looks pretty cool. And functionally, it has lots of mesh for airflow uh, to provide lots of cooling for the components that are inside, and it has plenty of room for cable management, and it's just a well-designed case that's fairly easy to build in, even if you're installing lots and lots of stuff. One final component that you might have if you're building a high-end system is supplemental fans. Whether you are getting fans to fill out the slots for fans that are in the case itself, or whether you're doing a fan replacement to make sure that all your fans look the same and have the same color scheme, fans these days are not only defined by their size, which is typically 120 millimeter square or 140 millimeter square, but also by the RGB elements that are included how those RGB elements connect up, and I'm gonna be talking about several different ways that that is done today. So there's a probably not very quick, but hopefully detailed introduction to this build. I'm gonna start taking the parts out of their boxes and we'll move on to step one. So right now we're working on motherboard setup, motherboard preparation, and I've already gone ahead and installed our 13900K. Again, CPU installation is covered in the part two build video if you want the details on that. 
Nothing changes with this socket. The uh, triangle is still in the corner of the CPU. It still lines up in the same way and still is secured in the same way. But just like you might with your case, it's a good idea to take a look at your motherboard and determine what is where. Specifically, you might want to note things like where the main power connectors are. The 24 pin is along this side. There's two eight pin power connectors up here at the top. You also might consider the location of fan headers around the board. And that's one thing I like about Asus motherboards is they tend to throw a lot of fan headers at the board. There's a few here along the bottom, a couple here next to the CPU socket, a couple more along the top edge, and do note the labeling on some of those. There is a header specifically labeled for the AIO pump, so we're going to plug in the lead that comes off the pump there so it can register the RPMs that the pump is running at. You might take a look at some extra features that your board has, like this one has a surface mounted start button that can be used to power the board on if you do an outside the box build like we did in the part two video. This board also has a debug LED readout up here, so if we encounter any issues when we initially start to boot up the system, uh, we can use that LED to help pinpoint those. Then beyond that, we have a pretty traditional layout here with four DIMM slots for memory next to the CPU socket. PCI Express expansion slots are down here, and then we also have M.2 slots for adding storage in between those, and most of these are covered up with heat sinks. We also have some SATA connectors here for adding SATA drives, and then all the way across the bottom of the board, we have stuff like our HD audio, front panel header pinouts, USB 2.0 connectors, there's a couple USB 3.0 as well, one here and one pointed to the side over here. You might keep in mind where RGB LED headers are. This board actually has four of them. There are two down here, which are the three pin five volt headers. Those are the newer ones that can handle addressable RGB LEDs. And there's one more here at the top next to a four pin 12 volt header, which is for the slightly older non addressable RGB LED style. And then right here in the bottom middle, you have your PCI Express expansion slots. The top slot here is going to be for your graphics card. And then you have several M.2 slots. A lot of these have heat sinks on top of them as well. And that is where you can add more storage. So the storage is what we're going to install next and we need to answer a few questions to figure out where we're going to plug in our drives. We have one PCIe 4.0 drive and two PCIe 3.0 drives and here is where you're going to want to double check your motherboard's manual, RTFM as they sometimes say, and you'll see that this motherboard actually has not two, not three, not four, but five M.2 slots and they're all labeled M.21, M.24, M.25, M.23, M.22. And we're going to use this information to determine a few different things. First of all, what PCI Express version each slot is compatible with. And if you read down here, you can see that the top slot, the M.2 underscore one slot is the only one that has PCIe 5.0 support, but all the other ones are PCIe 4.0 compatible. It is totally fine and acceptable to plug a PCIe 3.0 drive into a PCIe 4.0 or even a PCIe 5.0 slot, but you would not, for instance, want to to plug a PCIe 4.0 SSD into a slot that was limited to PCIe 3.0 bandwidth. So since we only have 3.0 and 4.0 drives, you might look at this list and think, oh, well, we can plug those SSDs in wherever we want. And in this case, that's true. You could plug any of our drives into any of these four slots and they would work pretty much to their full capabilities. But do note that these top two listed slots connect directly up to your Intel processor, whereas the lower three connect via the Z790 chipset. If you're plugging into slots that are routed through the chipset, they're gonna be routed through the chipset. That's gonna add a very, very small amount of latency, very, very slightly affecting the speed of the drive, which isn't that huge of a deal. But the chipset also connects to the CPU through a more limited number of PCI Express lanes. So I wouldn't, for example, want to populate all three of these lower slots with the fastest speed PCIe 4.0 drives because they would probably be hitting a bottleneck going through the chipset. Likewise, because we have this top slot here that's PCIe 5.0 compatible, and we don't have a PCIe 5.0 drive, but maybe we're gonna upgrade to that in the future. So you might wanna leave that slot open for a future upgrade. So based on this information, here's how I'm going to install our M.2 drives. Our PCIe 4.0 drive, which is our fastest drive, that's also where our operating system is gonna get installed. So I'm gonna install this drive to the M.2 underscore two slot. That's gonna give it full PCIe 4.0 bandwidth, by four, by the way. That will give it a direct connection to the CPU for the least amount of latency possible. And it's gonna leave that top PCIe 5.0 slot open, potentially for a future SSD upgrade. The two PCIe 3.0 crucial drives that I have here will be installed to uh, two of these lower slots here that connect through the chipset. And again, any one of these three slots would work for any of these two drives and they get pretty much their full performance. But once again, I'm noting that the uh, M.2 underscore five slot here also supports M.2 drives that use the older SATA protocol. And uh, maybe, who knows, maybe in the future we'll drop in an additional storage device that is a SATA M.2 drive. So for that reason, I'll go with the M.2 underscore three and M.2 underscore four slots 
for my two crucial drives. But wait, that's not quite all for determining our storage configuration. You should also double check if there are any conflicts between your storage drive slots, your M.2 slots, which use PCI Express lanes, and your traditional PCI Express expansion slots, like the ones that your graphics card slot into, because sometimes populating one will limit the connectivity of the other. And it's gonna be up to the motherboard manufacturer how the board is laid out and how those resources are distributed. So that is one of the differences, one of the nuances between motherboards is how this layout is done. In this case though, we can see that our expansion slots, our three expansion slots include our top PCIe 5.0 by 16 slot and then two PCIe 4.0 by 16 slots. And the only conflict that's listed is right here. When the M.2 underscore one slot is occupied with an SSD device, the top PCIe by 16 G5 slot will run at by eight speed only. So what that means is that this upper PCIe 5.0 M.2 slot, which also has the beefier heat sink on it because PCIe 5.0 SSDs can get hot enough to actually need a heat sink, but this slot shares bandwidth with the top slot for your graphics card when it's in use, which is actually another good reason to not install our PCIe 4.0 drive to this slot. Again, it leaves it open for expandability in the future, but it's also gonna mean we have full connectivity for our graphics graphics card. And for what it's worth though, even a graphics card is not going to need all the bandwidth that's available via a full by 16 PCIe 5.0 slot. But since we wouldn't be using that bandwidth here anyway, we're going to go ahead with the layout that I mentioned. All right, and with the heat sinks removed, we can see four of our M.2 slots. Again, I didn't uh, remove this top one for the top slot. The lower left slot right here is actually the second of the two slots that connects directly to the CPU. So that is where our WD PCIe 4.0 drive is gonna go. And again, I covered M.2 SSD installation and in a little bit more depth in the second video. Uh, but here we have this ASUS board that has a really convenient feature, which is this little guy, which you just spin around to hold it in place. You can also add one of the tiny screws that comes in the accessories right there, but here it's not really necessary. The heat sink that sits above that is actually a double heat sink that goes all the way across, uh, but since we're not installing a drive right there, we don't need to worry about that one. But don't forget to remove the little protective plastic cover over the uh, thermal pad, and that thermal pad is going to help the heat that the drive generates dissipate through this little heat sink. And we just tighten down the two screws on either side, and our little M.2 SSD is installed. Now, if I go back a few years of my PC building tutorials, I would only install the drive that the operating system was going to get installed to first, then I'd go about the rest of the build and getting my actual operating system installed before I connect up additional storage drives. However, since the the drives are now installing onto the motherboard, and since the motherboard is somewhat limited on space, and since the graphics card installs right here, and did you see that graphics card? It's pretty beefy. It's a chunky boy that is a four slot card, so it's going to block pretty much this entire space when it's installed. So with that in mind, we're gonna go ahead and install all our drives here, just so we don't have to uninstall our graphics card at some point to drop them in. And again, just one of those things that, uh, you know, the high-end builders can hold over the budget builders is, is just nice little features like that really easy to connect M.2 latch. And all right, our heat sinks have been remounted and can you tell that there's six terabytes of storage now on this motherboard that wasn't there before? Not really but it's there. To finish out the motherboard prep, we're gonna install memory and we're gonna install part one of our CPU cooler. Now, if you watched the part two video in this series, you know that I did an outside of the box build. And if you're intending to do that with your high end build, you might face a little bit of a dilemma. Of course, if you have a stock Intel air cooler like this one, you might need to apply some thermal paste to it, but you could pop that on to do a quick outside the box test. Or if you're just working with the hardware that I showed you guys today, you might have an all in one liquid cooler. So it might not be as feasible to do an outside the box test. So that is a step that you can skip and that's what we're gonna do today. Just know that you'll be bypassing that little bit of a peace of mind that comes from testing some of the core components of your system before you actually get it all installed in the case. Now, since we're assuming that you're using an aftermarket cooler for today's build, pretty much all aftermarket coolers are going to come with some form of backplate. And for our Corsair model, it comes with this one right here, which is a universal backplate, which is in an X pattern like this. Note that these can slide a little bit back and forth uh, because they are compatible with various different socket types. And you're actually gonna flip this upside down and mount it right here so that these thread points fit through these holes so that the cooler can be mounted securely from the opposite side. And before I move on, 
I want to point out that there are lots of different aftermarket CPU coolers out there. They might mount using different methods, so you should absolutely double check the manual that comes with your aftermarket cooler to make sure you're installing it properly, but a lot of them follow some of these same principles. Conveniently, this one comes with a little bit of adhesive on the back, and that's just going to help to hold it in place when it's actually mounted here to the back of the CPU socket. But with small adjustments to these mounting points on the outside, you should get them to line up, and then that will hold in place with the adhesive if you have adhesive. So flipping back over here to the front of the board, you should be able to see those mounting points poking through. And this is unique to ASUS boards, but they actually have two sets of mounting points here. The inner ones, the ones that are closer to the socket, are for LGA 1200 style CPU cooler mounts. Uh, that is the previous generation, so if you have an older cooler that's not officially compatible with LGA 1700, you can use those. But since we have an LGA 1700 compatible cooler and an LGA 1700 compatible board, we'll use the outer ones for the proper socket. Fortunately, our standoff mounts are in a nice little labeled baggie, so we can tell which ones they are. And for these standoffs, the threading is basically the exact same on both sides, so it doesn't really matter which way we orient them. But we're just going to thread these in and that will help to hold that back plate in place. This one right here in the corner always tends to be the trickiest to actually get your fingers on, but once those are all tightened down, that will hold the back plate in place. We can move on with the motherboard installation, and then when we come to it, I'll show you guys how to uh, add the thermal paste and install the actual CPU pump and block. Oh yes, and we should also install our memory, and again, memory is covered in the part two video in terms of installation, but just make sure you're lining up that notch on the bottom. This is also one of the motherboards that only has catches on one side. It's got sort of a auto catch on the other side, which I also mentioned in the part two video. But firm pressure straight down to seat them with a nice little snap. And then I'm only gonna install two of these memory sticks at first. And that's just to simplify the initial boot up. There can occasionally be issues running with all four DIMM slots populated. So this is just gonna make sure that we minimize any potential initial boot up problems that we have. And then because we're using an all-in-one liquid cooler that's gonna give us still plenty of access to these slots, we can drop the two other sticks in after the system has booted up and we make sure everything's working. There's a pretty decent chance that you're using a different case than I'm using today, but whatever the case may be, you should take the case out of the box and give it a thorough once over just to familiarize yourself with the layout, how things connect, and of course you will want to start removing panels where they are removable on the top side panels here. And for this one, you, know, you get a little handle and it swings out like this, and then you can lift it off like that. I'm noting a few things right off the bat with this case, since it is higher end and it's made for potentially higher end builds. Like you got removable panels down here that have mounting points for water cooling, open loop reservoirs and pumps. Lots of mounting points for fans or reservoirs or fans and reservoirs, uh, both at the front and at the top of the case. This panel here that can shift one way or another. So if you have an EATX motherboard, you can still make use of the grommeted pass-throughs. And even stuff like these little fold down panels that give you easy access to the basement of the case. Uh, for setting up additional drives or doing cable management with your power supply. You might also want to peruse your case's accessories. This one has a nice little box right there to keep things contained and organized. And also the manual is useful to keep on hand if you need to double check anything, or especially if the case has a unique feature that you've never seen before, figure out actually how that works. I removed the tempered glass panel from the rear side of the case here to show you this as well. These are just some aesthetic panel coverings to cover up your cable management areas. And there's lots of Velcro straps and stuff in there to keep things tied down and tidy. So if you watched that part two video, you should be pretty familiar with this case's layout, motherboard in the upper part, power supply sits down in the bottom, airflow moves from the front of the case and perhaps the bottom of the case to the back and the top. But before we move too much further with installing stuff, this is once again a great time to take a step back, reality check, and sort of get your build plotted out in your mind. We're going to be installing the motherboard right here, for example. We're gonna be dropping our power supply down into the basement of the case. But are there any extras, any things, especially beyond that budget build part two video that we're gonna need to connect up and therefore we're gonna need to consider having all of the connection points available for those devices. A good example is this little breakout unit that comes with our all-in-one liquid cooler from Corsair. This is a control box which can control not just the 
fans and RGB elements of the AIO itself, but there are a bunch more connection points on either side of this. On one side, you have typical fan headers, so you can plug in pretty much any case fan to those. And on the other side, you have a proprietary plug for connecting up Corsair-based RGB devices, such as the three fans that ship with this all-in-one liquid cooler. Each fan has its own header that you will need to connect to this device to power the actual motor in the fan and spin the blades. But if you want it to light up and look pretty, then you will also need to plug in this little header to this device and that will control the RGB LEDs. But just like a lot of these fans, we'll have two leads coming off of them, one for power for the motor and one basically for data to provide control for the RGB LEDs in the devices. Many of these control boxes will also have two leads coming off of them. One is a power connector that needs to connect directly up to your power supply to power this unit. And the second is a data connection. And in this case, it is a USB 2.0 header. So we're gonna to need to route that over and plug it into one of the free USB 2.0 headers on our motherboard. And that will make sure that after the system is built and the operating system is installed and you install the Corsair control software, it can reach out to this device to recognize it and then control anything that's connected to it. So this is actually part of the reason I decided to do a separate tutorial video for higher end builds that integrate a lot of RGB LEDs is because you can see this is just with the three fans that come with this AIO, you're adding so many additional cables that you need to wire up properly. And this is also why a lot of companies like Lian Li and Thermaltake have been coming out with RGB fans that actually connect up together so you can connect three fans and then only have one lead coming off of them to connect up your power and your RGB control. But I'm gonna quickly attempt to classify four types of RGB or non-RGB fan by how they connect. First, we have this fan at the back of the case, which is not RGB. All it is is a fan, so we have a glorious single four pin connector to plug into our motherboard or a fan controller to power it. The second type is fans that add RGB, but do it using the standard RGB connector. And as I already mentioned, there are two of those. One is a four pin connector that's 12 volt that can only do one color. And one is a three pin connector that's a five volt connector and those can do addressable RGB LEDs. So if you have multiple colored RGB LEDs in the same unit. The three fans at the front of this case are like that, as is this B quiet fan. It has one lead coming off that's a four pin for your power and one lead coming off that's that three pin addressable RGB connector. And thankfully the addressable RGB ones are daisy chainable. The third type are the ones like the Corsair fans here. They also have a dedicated connector for power. And I find that to be convenient because if I just need a fan, I can plug it in and it'll work. But the RGB connection for this one is proprietary. So you would need to connect this to an intermediary box before you connected it up to your motherboard. Lastly, there are fans out there that have a single lead coming off of them that connect up the power and RGB, but those are all proprietary connections that need to connect up to an intermediary hub like this. And also often need to be controlled by dedicated software. So you will find that a lot of the daisy chainable fans actually connect using that method. I'm gonna install the power supply next. You don't have to install the power supply next. You can actually do these in a slightly different order, but it seems like a reasonable choice to me. Uh, before I install the power supply, I'm gonna set it up by connecting only the cable that I need since this is a fully modular power supply that lets you do that. Because I've looked over all of my hardware, I know that the connectors I need are the main 24 pin motherboard power connector, two supplemental eight pin CPU power connectors. Those will also plug into the motherboard. Just a single SATA power connector for connecting up uh, SATA devices. And I'm actually not installing any SATA drives in this system right now, but I do need a SATA power connector for this Corsair control box. And lastly, for our graphics card, very convenient, all we need is this single 12VH power connector because this is rated for 600 watts. Do note that not all 12VH power cables are rated for 600 watts. They can be 300 watts or 450 watts. So if your graphics card requires 600 watts and you get a power supply that only says 450, then you'll probably wanna use the adapter that comes with your graphics card rather than the 12VH power cable. But regardless of what you do, you wanna make sure that that cable is plugged in and seated all the way. Power supply has been installed and I've routed the cables up to 
pretty much where they're going to line up with the motherboard and various things that they're going to plug into. But I've discovered a slight change to what I said earlier about how these front fans are wired up. And this might look like a big mess, but I think I can explain it to you fairly simply. These fans all have that same power connector for power to the motor. And they actually come with a three fan splitter that they're all connected up with. So you can just take this one plug, plug it into your motherboard and all of those fans should operate. For the RGB LEDs, however, they also have proprietary plugs, very similar to the Corsair ones, but those are actually pre-connected and wired up all the way to a RGB controller. That's one of the features of this case. And that means you can use the buttons up here on the front of the case to control the RGB lights in those three front fans. That does mean that we have a single SATA power connector for that controller up there to provide it with power. And that's okay, because we already have a SATA power cable coming from our power supply to plug that into. Speaking of the motherboard though, that is what we are going to drop in next. Motherboard installation here is going nice and easy. Fortunately, all the standoffs were pre-installed in the locations where I needed them, all nine of them. And again, video number two has all those little details on installing a motherboard, making sure your standoffs are lined up properly, making sure you have the screws that properly thread into your standoffs, and double checking that your motherboard either has a fixed IO shield or that you install the IO shield that comes with your motherboard before you install the motherboard. The next part of this video is gonna talk about installing the CPU cooler, the radiator, and the fans to the radiator, uh, but I'm gonna start with a quick uh, back to basics how to install a fan tutorial because I didn't really cover that in the first video and a lot of people will get extra fans to install to their system. So first off, for your entire system, it's best to have positive pressure, which means a little bit more fans pulling air in than blowing air out. That will help keep dust out of your case and that will also concentrate where dust is coming into your case, hopefully where you have dust filters aligned with those intake fans. The most typical fan sizes are 140 millimeters like this one here and 120 millimeters like this one here. It's a square measurement, so it's 140 or 120 on both sides for this one. The area where the fan connects, where there is a cross at the back to hold the motor up, is going to be the exhaust side almost 100% of the time. You could also potentially look at the sweep of the fan blades, but a lot of fans will actually have an indicator, although it's very, very small in this Corsair one. But you can see one arrow indicating the direction of the airflow, and then another arrow to the side that's indicating the direction that the fans actually spin. So once you've determined where in your case your fans are going to be mounted, uh, you will need to mount the actual fans. For that, you're going to use fan screws. And fan screws are fairly distinct from the M3 or the UNC632 screws that are used elsewhere in the system. They have very rough threading and this is actually meant to sort of bite or dig into the plastic just a little bit. So if I were installing this fan as an exhaust, I would want this part of the fan facing the back of the case and then I would line it up with the mounting points here. And I'm showing you guys this one because many cases will actually have slotted mounting points and that just gives you a little bit more flexibility. So you can slide the fan a little bit further up a little bit further down. So particularly in this case, if you mounted a top radiator, sliding this down to a lower position might give you a little bit more clearance. But I'm actually just gonna be reinstalling this 140 millimeter fan here. So I'm just gonna line it up with the four mounting points and then I will screw it in like so. So there's your basic fan installation. And then from there, you just wanna make sure that at least your fan's main power connector was plugged in either to the motherboard or to a fan hub. Of course, if you're installing fans to a radiator, you will not use those same mounting screws that you use to install a fan to the case. And you'll also want to double check how you're actually gonna position your radiator first as well. So hopefully you've been careful in your component selection or you've used maybe one of my suggestive guides that I do every month to pick your parts to make sure that you do have support for a 360 millimeter radiator in your case. And do note that there are different ways to mount a radiator. The top mount method here is probably the most traditional and the safest. The basic consideration that you're gonna to wanna to have is that you have a pump and a block in this combo unit here for most uh, all-in-one liquid coolers and you don't want this to be at the highest point in this little all-in-one loop. For some cases that allow you to mount a radiator at the front of the case, uh, the current wisdom is to put the tubes at the bottom if you have enough tube length to still reach up to your motherboard socket. But flipping the radiator over this way so that the tubes are coming out at the top is also acceptable. Again, as long as the place where this sits in your case is below the top of this radiator. By mounting the radiator to the top of the case, we don't really have to worry about that as much, but you do have to consider should the tubes be on this side or should the tubes be on the other side. Personally, I like the tubes to be on this side 
again, as long as you have enough tubing length to reach your block units over here to where your CPU is. And of course, I'm, I'm just very loosely holding this in the case right now to get an idea of how we're gonna position things. But if that is going to be our orientation, then we have three fans to mount to this radiator. We're gonna mount them to this side so we can see those fans and get a good look at them since they are RGB. And we want the air to be moving up to provide exhaust up and out of the case. So we are going to mount our fans to the radiator with that bracket facing that way. And then ideally, we're also gonna look at where these little cables are poking out, and we're gonna rotate the fans so that those are coming out at the back so we can more easily tuck them back behind the motherboard tray and manage those cables too. So the back edge here is gonna be facing the back of the case, so that's where I'm having the cables come out, lining these three up like this. And then you'll probably wanna reference the manual that came with your all-in-one liquid cooler just to make sure that you're using the proper screws for this part. And they do have a small diagram here showing you where the washers go and everything. Essentially, there should be some longer screws that are meant to go through fans and then into the radiator, and then some shorter screws that are meant to go with washers to mount to the case and secure the radiator to the case. Just take note that different radiators, different all-in-one coolers might use screws of different lengths. So I do not recommend using screws that didn't come with your AIO unless you double check that they're exactly the same length because there is a small possibility if you use the wrong screws, you can actually punch through and damage one of the radiator's fluid channels and that basically kills your radiator. And I'm sure you guys don't need general screwing advice, but it's best to not screw them in all the way. Leave them a little bit loose just so you can make sure everything's settled and then you can tighten them up by hand. At this point, we could sort of position the radiator in up here to mount it to the top of the case and kind of hold that in place while we awkwardly mount it, but this is a high-end build with a higher-end case, and I'm gonna take advantage of one of the features of this higher-end case, which is a removable radiator rack here at the top. In terms of actual useful features in a case, radiator racks like this uh, rank pretty high up for me. Definitely one of the reasons why investing in a higher-end case can often be very satisfying, especially for someone who's already built in a less expensive case. But this allows me to drop the radiator in from above. And while I do that, I'm also taking all these little cables from our fans, RGB and fan power, and passing them through our pass-throughs so they can be at the back in the cable management area to be plugged in in a minute. There we go. Okay, and now our radiator and fans are installed and all we need to do now is attach this pump block combo to the CPU. Next, we get to install our CPU pump and block, which is gonna sit right about there, but you might notice there's some plastic and there's some pre-installed thermal paste. If you have pre-installed thermal paste, that's totally fine to use as is for the purposes of this video and the tutorial. I'm gonna show you guys how to clean thermal paste and how to apply thermal paste raw, so to speak. So here goes, what do you need? You're gonna need a paper towel probably is a good thing to use. I also sometimes use uh, coffee filters. That's also a good solution. That's gonna be used to wipe up the thermal paste, but we need to break it up first. I'm gonna be using this stuff, which is made by Arctic Clean, which is a two-stage thermal material remover and thermal surface purifier. You do not need to be all fancy like this. You can use a mix of about 80 or 90% isopropyl rubbing alcohol and water, and that will clean it just fine. Also, if you're at all nervous, maybe don't do this over your motherboard and inside your case. You can totally do it outside your case, but uh, I'll hopefully be okay. Just adding a few drops there to break up the thermal paste that's already on it, and rub, rub, rubbing to clean some of it off. Might as well do a part two, just to make sure all that thermal paste is off of there. You can see there's still some coming off onto the paper towel. And just for good measure, we'll use our thermal surface purifier. Why do I use coffee filters? Uh, they work just as well as uh, paper towels, but they don't tend to leave like little little filaments, little little bits of stuff quite as badly as paper towels. But either option works just fine. All right, so now we have no thermal paste, but we need to re-add thermal paste. Some people can get really picky about their thermal paste. There tends to be only a few degrees variance from the nicer thermal paste to the maybe more, more mid-range thermal paste. I'm using some uh, Arctic MX4 here, which is an old standby. And there are two methods that I find acceptable. One is to give yourself a dot right there in the middle of the CPU, and we're aiming for maybe larger than a grain of rice, but maybe smaller than a pea, or maybe about a pea-sized blob. Does that look pea-sized to you? It's not necessarily an exact science, but with a blob there roughly in the center of the CPU, we could then go ahead 
and mount our cooler on top of that, and the pressure of mounting the cooler would spread the thermal paste out underneath it in a pretty satisfactory manner. I like to call that method the blob and squidge with shout outs to Tiny Tom Logan. Uh, I'm gonna use a spreading method, which I first learned from Gordon Ung from Maximum PC way back in the day. Any piece of plastic, piece of plastic wrap, something like that just to protect your finger. I'm also kind of holding it back to keep it taut and we're just gonna spread this around a little bit. There we go. Now the thermal paste is spread across the entire heat spreader on top of the CPU. Honestly, I probably used a little bit more thermal paste than I normally would on this application, but it's still totally fine. And from there, we're gonna mount our CPU block. Uh, our LGA 1700 bracket is already pre-installed on this, but double check that that's the case for you as well. And of course, we have no thermal paste and no plastic protective cover or anything like that on this right now. So we're gonna lower this down as evenly as we can on top of the four mounting screws. That thermal paste is almost gonna kinda hold it in place a little bit. F feels a little goopy, a little slippery right now to me. But I'm gonna keep this unit secured on top of the CPU with one hand while I get these four screws just threaded on with my other hand, possibly with the aid of a screwdriver if needed. It's always that corner one that's the trickiest. Okay, all my screws are threaded on there. At this point, I could probably let go if I wanted to, but I'm just gonna go ahead and start tightening these down. Once they start to snug up, go opposite corners. Don't just tighten one corner down all the way at the same time. Again, if you watched my part two build video for the budget build that's a little bit more for beginners, it's the same general concept. You don't wanna tighten down one corner. You wanna switch it up and go in a roundabout fashion until all of them are secured. Very good, that feels nice and stable. At this point, you could even like peel the protective plastic off if you're feeling very confident. And from our pump block combo, we have a couple leads coming off. One is the proprietary plug that's going to plug directly into that breakout box. And then the other one is this little guy. This is a standard three pin fan header, but it doesn't actually provide power, it reports RPMs. So that's all this does. And the best place to plug this in, if you have it on your motherboard, is the fan header that's labeled pump. That way in your UEFI or in your operating system, you can monitor your pump's RPM via that header. But if you don't have a dedicated pump header, you can plug this into any fan header on your board. Just note which one you plug it into and which one it's labeled so that you can also align that up in your UEFI to see which of the reported fan RPMs is actually your pump. We are now at the phase of the build where everything looks like so, so very close to being done. Everything's looking nice and clean in here. And you kind of think, well, let's just drop in the graphics card and call it a day. But there is one previous step to that that we need to handle, and that is the cable management. And while everything might look just fine from this side, the view from the back is still a bit rough, but let's cover what we need to plug in. So we already plugged in the two supplemental CPU power plugs and the main 24 pin power plug from the power supply. And as I covered in the part two video, I plugged in our 3.2 Gen 2 USB header and our USB 3.0 header. And that will make sure that our USB 3.0 ports and this Type-C port work up there. Also down here at the bottom, I plugged in our HD audio jack for the front panel mic and headphone ports. And again, I often consider this one to be optional, especially if you have a high-end headset, plug it into the IO on the back rather than the front. But for completionists, it's nice to plug that one in too. This is a fan plug, and I plugged this one into the uh, three fan daisy chain that comes from the three front intake fans. So they're all getting power right here. And this is not a USB 2.0 header. This is yet again a block of connectors for our front panel uh, power reset button and all of those things. So just like with our NZXT case in the part two video, uh, this Lian Lee case also uses this standard and I'm very happy with that because it just makes that way, way easier to plug in right there. And I already complimented the uh, removable radiator rack here uh, for this case for installing the actual radiator and the AIO. But another nice thing is that you can lift that up in order to access some of the sort of difficult to reach plugs along the top of the motherboard if you neglected to plug stuff in there. And it's slightly difficult to see, but I did plug in the single fan header there that comes from our all-in-one liquid cooler so we can monitor the pump RPMs via the water pump header on the motherboard. And then I'm gonna also plug in this addressable RG LED header uh, along the top of the motherboard there. There's several places on the motherboard I could plug this in and do note that it has a proprietary adapter here so um, if you're using a Li Li controller you can just plug it directly into that. But since we don't have a Li Li RGB controller in this uh, system I'm just going to plug this directly into the motherboard and let that motherboard control those LEDs. So that one gets plugged in right there and then we can reset this back on top very very carefully of course. 
The only other thing we need to pass through to plug in up here is uh, our little Corsair control box. That has a USB 2.0 header. So I've just fed this through from the back once again and plug it in right here. There we go. And now here at the back of the case, we're gonna work on our cable management. We can remove these little protective panels. They are just aesthetic covers and that will give us a little bit better access to various tie down points and Velcro straps. There are various philosophies and approaches in terms of cable management. Some people just get everything cinched down and wedged in there and as long as everything works, that's totally fine. Cable management is mostly an aesthetic thing. But of course, you can also get super particular with it and figure out where things are routed and then unplug and rewire things so that they sit in there really nicely. And, and that's totally up to you. Do, do it how you want to do it. But in order to make sure that the system is fully functional, there are a couple more things we need to plug in. I have two power connectors here. These are standard SATA power plugs. That's why we plugged this SATA power header into the power supply. These are those little L-shaped plugs, so you can really only plug them in one way. I'm gonna connect up each of these. This is also the same plug that you would use for a 2.5 inch or 3.5 inch supplemental SATA drive. 2.5 inch drives can mount here. 3.5 inch drives have cages down in the bottom. And again, you can check out that part two video for a little bit more on plugging in supplemental storage drives, particularly SATA drives. I am doing the bare minimum of cable management just to get things cinched down so I can close the side panels. And of course, connect up our last few connectors that need to be connected. The proprietary connector coming from our all-in-one pump block unit plugs in right here. There's a little white mark to indicate which side faces the right way. So now I can take all of these cables uh, from our top AIO uh, fans, the RGB ones and the power ones. In the past, I've taken these RGB leads, which are all labeled with two RGB hub on them and actually numbered them so I can plug them in in the right order. And you might want to do that depending on how many RGB fans you're connecting up to a single hub like this, since these are labeled with numbers. Fortunately though, the Corsair software does allow you to sort of reconfigure and move around uh, the fans in the software. So even if you don't plug these in in the same order, like one, two, three for fans, one, two, three in the case, uh, you should still be able to reconfigure that with the software. And lastly, we have our three fan power plugs, and I'm just gonna also plug these into spots one, two, and three on this little control box. And honestly, it is stuff like this that just doesn't look that great when you're when you're setting it up and you've got cables running everywhere. And especially if you're adding more RGB LED fans in this, it can get pretty complicated. So once again, I don't blame anyone who decides, you know what, the RGB thing, it's just, it's a lot of work for basically just looking pretty. And so I'm just gonna skip it and that's okay. There are also different ways to mount these control boxes to the case. Some of them have magnets on the back and will just stick in place. This one does not, but it comes with some dual-sided adhesive strips that you can attach like this. So that is what I'm gonna do, just so I can attach this right up here to this convenient flat panel. And now, once again, just sort of tucking cables away wherever I can. There. Uh, so this is absolutely not ideal and cable management is the type of thing that you can invest a lot of time in and make it look really nice. But before you invest too much time, I would suggest just getting stuff set up basically so you can again power the system on and make sure it's functional. Unfortunately, the GPU installation is pretty much the same as in the part two video. I removed the two rear uh, panel covers for the PCIe slot covers. That is because the bracket on this one is a two slot bracket, even though the card is very thick and takes up four slots. Some of the brackets on these higher end GPUs are actually three slot brackets, so uh, keep an eye out for that. Also keep, keep an eye out for a protective cover on your actual PCIe edge connector. And we're just gonna line it up with that PCI Express slot and give some firm pressure to install it. I have the case standing up right now. Uh, if you are at all uncomfortable with this process, you can totally lay the case on its side again. I was kind of talking, but there was a nice satisfying snap there as the catch engaged to hold this card in place. Then we'll just use these two thumb screws to secure it. If you're using a big chonky boy graphics card like this, you might use a GPU support to prevent that unsightly GPU sag that can occur with heavier graphics cards. If you don't want to use that support or if you just want to see if your GPU is capable of supporting itself, give it some support on this side to try to keep it as level as possible as you tighten down these thumb screws. And that might be enough to hold the graphics card up in a satisfactory way. And lastly, for graphics card power, we have our 12VH power connector. Again, note there's a catch on one side, very similar to the uh, main motherboard power connectors. We will align that, seat it. Make sure that these plugs are seated all the way and that this catch engages. And now we have that nail-biting moment of truth yet again as I plug in the power supply back here 
flip the power switch on. Well, if you're at all superstitious and you don't want to anger the PC building gods with your overconfidence, then leave the side panels off for the first boot. If I can awkwardly reach the power button, we have power. This system appears to be functional, and what will often happen when you're first booting up a system for the first time, especially if you have RGB lights and other things like that connected that haven't been configured, is they might turn on or they might not turn on based on the default settings for the controllers that are controlling the different RGB elements in the system. So our Corsair fans at the top lit up for a second, so at least we know the LEDs are working, but it's probably just defaulting to the LEDs being off with the control box. Beyond that though, all of the other fans are spinning up properly, the motherboard is working, great. So we have here what appears to be a fully functional high-end gaming PC, but we're not quite through yet. This is part three of a four-part series, so I invite you guys to stay tuned for the part four setup video where I talk about going from the build to a fully working system, getting Windows installed, setting up stuff with the UEFI, making sure your memory is running at the right speed, reality checking that your temperatures are within the right range that they should be, and of course getting some games installed so you can actually game on your new gaming computer. But I would like to say a big thank you to all of you guys for watching this series up till now. I would also like to say a huge thank you to Micro Center for sponsoring this video, and you can find links to Micro Center down in the video's description, as well as links to all the parts that I used in this build today. So stay tuned to get subscribed if you're not already for when that part four video goes live. Hit the thumbs up button on this video if you enjoyed it. Again, check the description down below for links to all the relevant things. Thank you one more time for watching this one, and we'll see you guys in the next video.